Well, uh, again, thank you for those kind words of introduction. And, uh, I, you know, for me, it's always a delight to speak to a group who are interested in the weather. And I can't imagine a group of people more interested in the weather than the nature enthusiasts associated with the Georgian Bay Land Trust. Uh, I am sure you are from urban areas and rural areas and suburban areas and, and all over this, uh, this great province and perhaps maybe outside of uh, Ontario. But I am sure all of you have that one common denominator, uh, uh, very conscious about the weather, you're very conversant about it and, and very weather sensitive. And for me, hey, this is not a, this is not a just I'm doing nothing on a Thursday night, so I'm going to speak to you. This is for me a great thrill uh, to have this opportunity to speak to the, to the good people uh, dedicated to the preserving and protecting of this of the land and the air and the water and the life in this uh, this precious piece of geography we call the uh, Georgian Bay uh, uh, watershed. So you know I um, I. I it is, of course, a beautiful area. I was so inspired by that that great video and the and the good work that you uh, that you uh, you do. Now, in terms of, I've often boasted. I mean, I talk a lot about the weather. As I was mentioned, I've been around for uh, fifty years. I've seen a lot of weather come my way, and um, and I often boast that we live in one of the healthiest and safest climates in the world. I mean, come on, more Canadians die falling out of bed than die from weather. I mean, my boss has never liked me to say that, but hey, I mean, we do have a lot of weather. It doesn't mean we have a, a gentle climate. Uh, we we uh, really um, have some of the most dramatic uh, weather of any place in the world. I mean, a, a normal year in Canada, we would say that we'd have maybe two or three tropical storms enter Canadian waters. We are the second most tornado prone country in the world. Uh, I mean, we don't get as many nearly as the United States. I mean, they're the, the champions. We're minor leagues. We get maybe 100 or 120. You know, I think we get a lot more than that. It's just that there are not enough Canadians around to see these things when they do uh, touch down and to be able to uh, document. We get uh, 3 million lightning hits. And, you know, and temperatures that vary from plus 50 to minus 50. So we have a lot of variety of weather in this, uh, in this country. Now, projections have it, though, by the, by the middle of this century that we're in, that we will inherit the climate of 600 kilometers to the south. And that's important because the United States gets more severe weather than any other country on planet Earth. And so, as they say, uh, stay tuned. Uh, you, you haven't seen anything yet. Now, no place in Canada will look 40 years from now, like it does now. And every Canadian will be affected by this. Some more than others. Um, nobody's gonna be left out in the cold, but people such as the sick and the elderly, the refugees, the indigenous peoples, the unemployed, uh, these people who are already becoming victims of climate change will probably feel it more than, than most, uh, most Canadians. And, and really, I mean, these are the early victims of climate change. And, and really, they, they haven't really contributed uh, to the problem like, like others who are perhaps maybe more resilient and able to withstand the kind of vagaries that we see uh, with our, our climate. You know, actually, I don't think we have to wait. I mean, we are already seeing an increasing weather having an increasingly greater effect on us because it's changing faster than we can, can cope uh, with it. Now, in recent years, we've made great advances in our understanding of the workings of the global climate system. I mean, we have seen significant changes. When I began as a climate researcher, I mean, we would look at the climate as a global or atmospheric kind of phenomenon. Now it's more local. And we think know that things that happen local mean more to us than, than happen on a global basis. Um, we used to talk about climate change in terms of centuries or millennium. Now it's decades or, or shorter. Uh, we used to talk about it being as averages, and now it's more about the extremes. Um, it used to be, oh, something that will be futuristic. Hey, it's now the here and now, and it's and here to stay, that what we're seeing. Uh, even the name has changed. We, we, you know, 20 years ago, we called it global warming. 
And now we call it climate change, recognizing that it was more the temperatures that were changing. I think if we called it atmospheric terrorism, we'd have this thing nailed to the ground. But you know, even the, the hope, the, uh, the, the solution for this has different, it's changed over, over time. You know, we used to think, well, let's cut back on our, our fossil fuels. And now that didn't seem to be going anywhere. So now what we say is, well, what we should do is to embrace adaptation, build resiliency, make our communities more weatherproof. I mean, that's how people seem to be attacking uh, the kind of changes that we've seen. And ladies and gentlemen, this redirection, I think is so important because for me, it has meant that the, the public is now engaged with climate change like never before. I mean, they used to think, well, climate, oh, that's academic, that's statistical, uh, that doesn't affect, it's not relevant to my, my normal life, you say. It's about, you know, skinny polar bears and who gives a rat's ass about a skinny polar bear? I mean, that's the kind of comment that you, that you hear. It's not, not affecting me, it's futuristic. I'll be safely dead before it begins to bite deep and hard. But that's the kind of thinking that climate was seen as of the past. Now we think, oh my gosh, climate, and you know, if you change the climate, you change the weather. And, and weather is really, is real. It, it's experiential. It is, it matters to me in my daily life. I look out the window and I can see the climate and I can see the weather. And certainly if that's part of the climate, then I'm seeing that, you say. We're more hardwired to weather than we are to, to climate. And I think that has really been a, a significant change to the public's sort of acceptance of responsibility for perhaps changing the climate and perhaps maybe wanting to do, do something about it. So in recent years, I think the vast majority of Canadians have said, you know, we've been cursed and clobbered a lot harder and more often in recent years. It's almost the stuff of Hollywood catastrophes, hailers, deluges, ice rain, super typhoons, biblical scriptures kind of, uh, uh, of weather, some of the most extreme and disruptive and destructive weather in the history of our country. And you know, we used to think that we somehow were immune from nature's wrath. I mean, these things occurred on the, the other side of the world uh, to a society different than ours, you say. Oh, 100 year storms occurred every 100 years. Summers were hot and winters were cold, you say. And, um, and you know, it, this was the thinking. And, and really, I think what we've seen is that past extremes weren't more predictable, but they were more foreseeable. There were fewer surprises. We kind of come to expect that. So we have this thing in, in climate, in climate called this zone of familiarity or zone of natural variability. So within that period of, of living, you could see, well, we had storms and hundred year storms. If you lived a hundred years, you saw one of those things. Um, but now what we're seeing is that things aren't as familiar to us. We're seeing these things are occurring outside of the, the realm of familiarity, out of the zone of variability, that these are easier to create. And because we've never seen them before, it, it's hard for us to, uh, to cope with them, you say. And at the same time, our infrastructure, which is built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, is not able to handle it. It's failing us. Our, our flood-proofing mechanisms aren't working, uh, where sinkholes are appearing and our, our highways and roads and bridges are, are crumbling. Uh, pipes and sewers are cracking and leaking. And I can guarantee you, there's probably in Canada, and it's not the, a developed part of the world, this is uh, uh, our, our developing part of the world is developed, we're seeing at least 600 communities have a boiled water advisors. And so nobody has been left out in the code. It doesn't matter which province or territory, north or south or urban and rural. We're all kind of seeing this in, in different, different degrees and different types, but, but everybody is, is seeing these, uh, these events. And for me, I look back in my career and I said, well, was there a, an epiphany moment? And there was for me. I look back, I've seen a lot of weather in my time. And I think it was back in 1996 with the Saguenay flood. I remember I was living in Aurora at that time. And I, I was Sunday, I was walked to the corner store to pick up the newspaper. And there was the headline, our first billion dollar weather related disaster. More water fell on the Saguenay that weekend. 
and would flow over Niagara Falls in two months. And then came the, the ice storm from hell, from Kingston to the Bay of Fundy. More ice rain fell in five days than you would see in a normal two year, two and a half year period. And uh, we brought more wire and cable down in that ice storm than would stretch around the world three times. And I was probably the busiest of my career on that occasion. I mean, I was asked to comment to about the weather to people in Europe, South America, United States, every, every place but Canada. And I got a lot of questions. And, and the two questions most asked me, well, what's the big deal? Um, Montreal and Ottawa have never looked more beautiful than they do right now. And of course, freezing rain will, will do that to you. But also, what could possibly bring Canadians to their knees in the wintertime. We're, we're the winter weather people. If we couldn't handle it, that nobody could. I, I think that that same year, I was the second busiest. Environment Canada launched a research balloon um, west of Saskatoon to measure the rarefied gases of the, of the upper atmosphere, the ozone layer and, and other inert gases. It was a very successful experiment, a 15-story balloon. It wasn't a weather balloon, but a research balloon. But kind of embarrassing for our department is that we, well, the last day we went to jettison the balloon from the instrument package and the balloon took off. We couldn't get it back. And my job was to explain to the world where this balloon was. And people, I think, were cheering for the balloon. It was like the big balloon that couldn't, you say. And it went across the North Atlantic. It scrambled transatlantic flying for, for two days. NATO came out and filled it full of bullet holes. And this balloon kept on trekking finally settled down in Finland. We brought it back to Toronto, gave it kind of a hero's welcome. What a voyage it had been on. Uh, we called it the Viagra Blue. We, we got it up, but we couldn't get it down. So, so I mean, hey, uh, strange things happen with the, uh, with the weather. And we've had so many examples. I could spend the whole night talking about the misery, hardship, and misfortune that has been falling Canadians because of extreme weather. And let, let me just hit a couple of places, uh, maybe in the, in the, uh, uh, the um, uh, Georgian Bay area and, and nearby, and some of these events that you might remember. You remember in May 21st, we had this incredible direco that crossed Ontario and raked the province from, uh, from Windsor to, to Ottawa to Quebec City and the Eastern Township. So an incredible, uh, fierce, uh, a fierce event. Well, back in 1995, on July the 14th, 15th, there was a very similar kind of windstorm, uh, a, a huge thunderstorm at night, about two o'clock in the morning, came across the upper peninsula of Michigan uh, into the Georgian Bay area and Muskoka, and it just brought winds of 135 to 160 kilometers per hour, took down millions of trees. There were six brief tornadoes in there. They, Prime areas hit were uh, Huntsville and, and uh, Bracebridge and, and uh, Aurelia and Minden and, and Fenland Falls. It was really called in history, the Adirondack Direco because it crossed uh, Lake Ontario into New York State and did much more damage there, but still power was out for, for days, if not weeks in the, in the Georgian Bay um, uh, area. Uh, then in, um, uh, in 2010, you might remember it. I, I remember one of these, uh, this, this moment. We had an earthquake in Southern Ontario in Quebec during the day. And six hours later, there was a tornado in Midland, Ontario. Now, some people think they're connected. Well, uh, we have a hard time getting the, the atmosphere right, but hey, we leave underground to, to other people. But people thought they were connected, but, but not at all. But that particular Midland tornado, an EF2 tornado with winds that were up to about 170 kilometers per hour. It took out um, uh, 70 vacation trailers and injured nine people, I think it was 8,000 people without power. And it was so fortunate, it occurred on the, I think the Tuesday, Wednesday, as opposed to the weekend. Otherwise, there could have certainly been uh, uh, many more injuries and, and deaths. You might remember in 2013, the incredible flooding in the Muskoka region. Um, early winter was a, it was a tough kind of a, a winter. It was um, more snow than we normally get, but you know, it really wasn't abnormal when I look back at it. Um, but what happened was that early April, first two weeks of April were very winter-like. 
So the 50 centimeters of snow that were sitting on the ground in some parts of central Ontario stayed put. The ice was still in the rivers and the, um, and the lakes. And then spring came, lasted three minutes. So you went from slush, to sweat, summer came. And you had tropical rains, warm temperatures, and you, yet you had the landscape in winter. And then you ended up with one of the worst um, flooding in that region's history. You had um, a thousand people having to be rescued. You had eight communities staring declaring states of emergency. You had sinkholes in, in, in highways. I mean, it was clearly um, a multi-million dollar hit and, uh, and people weren't necessarily prepared for it. You might remember, I always bring it up when I know there's some Toronto audience, uh, uh, back in um, uh, July the 8th, 2013, uh, a rain event, the adult. It was a two hour rainstorm. I mean, it wasn't even forecasted as an extreme event. It was just gonna be an interesting day. And from 4.30 to 6.30 in the evening, this storm from Georgian Bay that grew powerful and exploded, stalled, combined with another storm and dumped 126 millimeters of rain at Pearson and almost the same amount downtown. And that area, there's not a lot of green space in that area. And so that there was more rain fell in that two hours then fell during Hurricane Hazel in one day in 1954. And of course it filled uh, basements. There was, um, it stopped um, um, go trains. Um, it was a uh, billion dollars in, in losses and many, I think 13,000 basements were flooded. And you know, every time a basement floods in Ontario, it costs somebody about $45,000. So you could do the, the math and, and see why this was a clearly a big, uh, a big event. But I could, as I said, I could spend the whole evening talking about all the misery, hardship, and, uh, and misfortune. But let me focus just on last year. Never have we seen a more destructive, disruptive, expensive, and impactful, and deadlier year in Canadian history than we saw in 2021. And British Columbia was ground zero to it. The province was baked and desiccated and scorched and flooded and buried in, in rock and, and, and uh, tree debris. Uh, you found the infrastructure was absolutely buckled and collapsed under constant, almost year-round assault during that time. And what scientists were warning about 20 years ago really came to pass in 2021 for most Canadians. I think it was the year that climate change began to bite deep and hard in our country. Now, prior to that, I mean, most Canadians were of the opinion, well, climate change was an Arctic problem, an Inuit and Denny kind of, uh, of a problem. I mean, you had ice, uh, uh, ice thinning, you had ocean liners appearing in the Northwest Passage in the middle of summer, uh, you had um, you know, skinny, skinny uh, polar bears. Uh, I mean, this was what people thought climate change was uh, in, in Canada. But in 2021, I think Southerners witnessed for the first time the real threat and impact of climate change out their windows, in their own neighborhoods, their own backyards. And it shocked them, the variety and the intensity of the kinds of extremes that we've experienced in Canada uh, ne like never before. And of course, it, it all began like a year ago, almost a year ago this coming week, that big juggernaut of a high pressure area sat over British Columbia in Alberta and just wouldn't let any weather in. It stretched from the Arctic Circle to, to California and the weather just broiled inside that, that dome. And, uh, and we set uh, a new national record, Little Lytton, British Columbia, set a record one day. It broke the record the second day. It broke a record the third day. Now a temperature almost 50 degrees in Canada and on the fourth day, uh, Little Lytton burnt down. But that we broke records for the number of temperatures we broke during that incredible heat, heat wave. Um, you know, we are the second coldest country in the world. We can now boast about temperatures that are warmer than any place in Europe ever, any place in South America ever, and any place outside of the, in the United States, outside of the desert Southwest. Lytton is even warmer than Las Vegas and Phoenix. So it was truly 
an incredible event. And of course, the, the, the insane heat left millions overheated. It, it melted asphalt, it buckled highways, fruit baked on trees and vines and, and salmon cooked in, in, in streams. And tragically, the hottest week was the deadliest too. I mean, think about it. We usually set up a Royal Commission when three people die from a heat wave in Canada. 600 people in British Columbia, 200 in, um, in, in Alberta, incredible. And then came the flood of floods in the fall. The two events are not related except this very important point is that, that the heat and the fires, the drought that ensued with that heat wave, it baked the ground, it scorched the ground, it blackened the soil, it denuded the vegetation. So when those rains came, there was nothing to protect them. Nothing, they just, the water went where it wanted to go, you say. And so that was, I think, the fallout from that one event in terms of making that, the impacts of that second event uh, didn't cause the extreme, but the impacts were significant and, and unprecedented because of that the, the ground was no longer able to accept the, the fall rains. I mean, fall is the monsoon season in British Columbia. September, October, are, were wet. November is the wettest month of the year on average. And it had a new, broke a new record for the amount of rain that we got by the 15th of the, of the month. So as I say, the, um, the, uh, these atmospheric rivers, these conveyor belts of moisture from Hawaii it just made a beeline for the South Coast and, like, and just like jumbo jets on the airport tarmac, they just hit, hit it one, one after another. So you had, a, a, as I say, sides of mountains broke away. You had a slew of slides, uh, um, uh, rock and mud and debris flows. And, and, and the infrastructure was, you know, it was just, it was just disappeared. I mean, the highways, highways and, and bridges and pipelines and rail lines and ports and I mean, it was just assaulted. And these were not just fixes. These were almost, you know, having to, to reconstruct this kind of infrastructure at huge cost. So Canadians, I think, were, were numbed by the, by the scene of, of Armageddon across British Columbia and the infrastructure. I mean, it was almost like a scene out of the third world. I mean, uh, infrastructure was gutted. Entire towns were abandoned. The military was called in. Fuel and food was, was being rationed. And, and fertile lands, some of the best in Canada, were under waters for as far as you could, uh, you could see. Now, another big story this year was the drought. Canada Dry, from, from coast to coast, right into northwestern Ontario, where we had some terrible fires that, uh, uh, and we could smell the smoke in the, in, the, in, in the Georgian Bay area and Toronto from those fires that were occurring in northwestern Ontario and, uh, and elsewhere. It was, in fact, one of the um, the, the most extensive, longest lasting, and most extreme droughts we've seen. People were comparing it to the dirty 30s. And the impact on food producing sector was enormous. The food prices went up and they're still up. Uh, economic losses were in the billions. Farmers lost their livelihoods. And in some cases, they lost their lives because the suicide rate on the prairies was the highest ever last year. And then all of this, the hot and the dry led to relentless year of wildfires and smoke. I mean, on July the 10th, I remember that, I looked back and I thought, oh my gosh, there are fires out of control in every province and territory except Nunavut and Atlantic Canada. And, and although, you know, in the final windup, we can't attribute a single year or a, a weather event solely to human-caused climate change, the evidence is, is conclusive that we are experiencing more intense and more frequent extreme weather. And in rigorous studies done following what's happened in British Columbia last year, scientists around the world concluded it would have been virtually impossible to have that record uh, heat dome without the contribution from human beings. And also the, the flooding would have been two or three times more likely to have occurred because of the influence of, of human beings. So, you know, hopefully what we saw uh, won't be ignored in 2021. It may be the turning point, and I think confirmation for majority of Canadians 
that there is clear and present link between climate change and extreme weather. And uh, just no, no denying it. Now, what can we conclude from this, um, this parade of, of costly disasters? Well, I think one thing that we see is that, you know, it's not just something that occurs in Bangladesh or Botswana or Bolivia. It occurs in Burlington and Brandon and, and Burnaby. I mean, we're not weatherproof to these things that are happening around the world. And we know that costs have, have, have skyrocketed. I mean, we are seeing insurance companies, just ask your insurance agent, they're paying out more for weather and water now than they paid out um, uh, for fires, like two or three times more for, for weather and water events than fire events, which is the reason they got going. I mean, insurers are convinced that the climate is mutating and, and, and convulsing. And the federal government too is, you know, they used to ignore extreme events. It was treated as like snow removal budgets. Oh, you know what? You got, you know, some years you got you won and some years you lost. But it's affecting our balance of payments and our in economic indicators that we can't afford to ignore. You know, there's a fund in, in the government called the Disaster Financial Assistance Relief Fund. They've paid out more for weather and water extremes in the last six years than they paid out in the previous 39 years. Hey, there's no denying it. It's much more than what we've ever seen. And in the business sector, my gosh, I mean, they used to, I've been there when the, in the boardrooms in Canada. And in the 90s, they were skeptical, suspicious of climate change. And now they've embraced it. Shareholders and stockholders are saying to CEOs, not just do you believe in it, but what are you doing about it? You see? And more, I think one of the greatest progress we've seen is the way that companies have embraced this as a real threat to prosperity. And there's clearly a need to do something about it. So, you know, what is behind this extreme, this, this increase, apparent increase of, of weird and extreme weather? Well, a couple of things to get straight. What we're not seeing is new weather. That may be shocking to you, but it's not, it's still our grandparents' weather or our parents' weather. I wish it was different. I wish we had typhoons in Toronto, sandstorms in Saskatoon and, and monsoons in Montreal. Then you could say, oh my gosh, the world's upside down. We're clearly seeing weather we've never seen before. But what has changed though, is the statistics of weather change. And that's really what climate is. What is climate? It's the statistics of weather. I mean, that's how our, there's a, def, a textbook or a dictionary definition of it. So what we're seeing is that storms appear to be, you know, larger, um, more widespread, more frequent out of season, out of place. They've slowed down. I used to say the best thing about Canadian weather is that it, it hits and runs. But now it's raining on Thursday, it's still raining on Saturday. So it's got more time to spread its misery than ever before. We're also seeing multiple day events and multiple category overlapping crises, not just hailstones, but it's hailstones with strong winds. Or on the Atlantic coast, it's all oh, those big Atlantic storms but my gosh, you've got to now consider the, the sea levels are so high that it's inundating. Those same old uh, garden variety storms are, are inundating more area. Or you're seeing in British Columbia, as I described to you earlier, you're seeing the vegetation is being burnt. It can't hold back the, the rains during the wet season. And so you end up with more flooding and more uh, tree debris and, and, and all whatever. Further, there's another change, another thing that we have to keep in mind is that it used to be in my business, what was important was how much rain is falling from the sky. That's still important. But also now we have to consider what surface is it falling on? That's almost important to look at the impact of the event. You know, that 50 millimeters of rain that falls in Toronto now is not the same 50 millimeters of rain that fell in Toronto back in 1954. And it's because our landscape has been environmentally degraded and re-engineered. You know, 50% of the land use of planet Earth is different now than it was a hundred years ago. You know, we're cutting down trees and not replacing them. We're taming rivers, straightening them, reclaiming land from the sea. We're building dams and reservoirs on watercourses. 
ladies and gentlemen, I'm not against that. I'm just saying to you that when you build a dam or a reservoir, you change the, the, the hydrology of that river of course, that water course. You know, 100 years ago, there were no dams in the world over 15 meters. Now there are 40,000. So no wonder the great rivers are mere trickles by the time they, you know, they enter the uh, sea. The other thing we're doing, which I think is the greatest tragedy in Ontario's history, environmental history, is that we are draining the swamp. We're filling in floodplains and wetlands. Wetlands, you know, help to buffer us from floods and, and drought. Um, and tragically in Ontario, we have lost in most of the province and in some urban areas, up to 80% of the wetlands have disappeared. We think progress is filling them in. Get rid of that mosquito infested pool of water, build condos and, and farm fields. And we think that's progress for some reason. You know, and, and a couple of years ago, um, uh, the province uh, suggested that in, um, with, with even those lots of criticism, I'm sure from, from your organization and from environmental groups, the general public, that would allow, that, that suggested that with legislation that the conservation authorities should um, issue development permits in, in weather sensitive areas. And could you imagine trading a piece of land that took nature thousands of years to form and comparing it with a piece of, of land that just looks like scrubland, you know? And then of course, the, the other thing is that there is this thing called urbanization. It is the greatest land transformation in the world. It doesn't represent a huge piece of the geography, but it is the biggest change that we're seeing. You know, nowadays, right now, 2019, was the first time in human history there were more people living in cities in the world than in rural areas. And by 2040, it's estimated that two thirds of the people in the world will be living in built up areas, developing urban heat islands and, and transforming the, the geography like that. I mean, the cityscapes are sheathed in, in concrete and, and pavement. There's just too many hard surfaces going around. And, and we seem to, like to transform green infrastructure like wetlands and wildlands and woodlots into parking lots and strip malls and, and clover leaves on highways. And you know, these urban surfaces are impervious to raindrops. Doesn't matter how dry Toronto is or, or, or London. I mean, these, this raindrop becomes a flood drop uh, when it falls on a, on a urban area with concrete and pavement and, and, and building materials. Um, you know, and in that rain, uh, uh, it fills basements, subway tunnels, and, and, and underground um, uh, corridors. And, and, um, and you know, it's, it's what we call the Walmart effect. You know, when it rains on a grassy knoll, it takes about eight, eight hours to get down to the water table. But on a Walmart parking lot, it takes about eight minutes or so. So flooding, Maybe an act of God, but flood disasters and floods are an act of, of humankind. And you know, the point is, I recognize it. You can't stop that storm from coming your way, but you can prevent it from becoming a disaster by properly preparing for it and, and responding for it, to it. So even without climate change, these, these little hits of the of the past would become major blows because the impact, the fallout and the effect has changed. So yes, it's, it's not our grandparents' weather because of typically what we own, what we possess and what we do with our land. And of course, the other thing we have to come to grips with is that the world is warming up. I mean, you can't get scientists to agree in anything, but 98% of scientists believe the world is warming up faster and greater now than it has in a long time. I mean, 2021, was the 45th year in the row in the row when you stuck a thermometer in planet Earth and it said warmer than the long-term average. 45 years in a row, you say. And so there's no convincing alternative to this other than the human condition, the human uh, contribution that we've made to it. I mean, if you took all natural forces that change the climate, that has claimed the climate for eons of time, 
you know, volcanoes and, and ocean temperatures and that, that geometry between the earth and the sun. And, and um, uh, we should have had modest cooling in the last 35 years, not runaway warming. And, and also Canada is warming up faster and greater than in half the time that the world has, we say. And, um, and particularly in the North. I mean, I think our first victims of climate change worldwide are our Northern people in Canada. It's, war it's warming up three times faster than the global average. And it's where, yes, it, it, it's the ice is disappearing, the thinness of the ice, the volume of ice is left. Uh, that even that when I began my career, that 85% of the ice in the Arctic was that turquoise ice, that hard ice, that it was hardest ice that nature ever formed. Now about 15% of it is, is that. So there's some time this, this soon, sooner rather than later, that we'll see ice-free Arctic during the, uh, the summer period. And so what we're seeing is again, the effects on polar bears, uh, we're seeing on wildlife, uh, there's more search and rescues, like never before the elders can't read the ice anymore in the north, having to travel distances to fish and to hunt. Uh, we're seeing that um, you can't build ice roads anymore in the north. It's amazing how they're able to keep those alive and, and with a, a, some weeks of, of that occurring. We're seeing a lot of the infrastructure is just crumbling. Windows don't fit frames anymore. Houses are being condemned and abandoned at record at record uh, weight, and even the wildlife. I mean, the Inuit people had to hold a conference, I think it was about 10 years ago, to come up with new words in the Anakitak language for dragonfly and cougar and barn owl and robin. We'd never seen these creatures before. Not only were they seeing them, they were staying put. They were, they were spending the winter there in some of these uh, areas. And we've also seen a response to the to warming of the natural environment. Uh, we're seeing, for example, uh, glaciers are melting six times faster now than they did in the 1980s. Uh, we're seeing sea levels are rising. And not only because the water is warming and it expands, but also because the ice caps in Antarctica and, and, and the north on land is melting and, and, and adding to the, to the volume of, um, of water. And even more convincing evidence, I think, comes from the natural world. I always think the last species to know about climate change are people. We wait for the big black cloud to hang over us before we say, mm, it smells like rain, you say. But already plants and animals and fish and birds and insects are being marginalized and evicted from their habitats because of, of the runaway kind of warming. We've seen maple trees. I mean, what could be more Canadian than maple trees? The sugar off dates prior to 1980, 80% occurred after the first day of spring. Now 80% are occurring before the first day of, uh, of spring. I mean, we're growing um, magnolia trees in Sault Ste. Marie, and they're, and they're thriving. I mean, tulips in Parliament Hill are growing six days earlier than they did 12 years ago. I predict my fearless forecast in 35 years, Ottawa will be holding the Tulip Festival in Winterlude on the same weekend, we say. I mean, that's the kind of dramatic changes that we've, uh, we've seen. And, and uh, the deer tick. I mean, this used to be a problem in Rondeau Park and Long Point. And now from Winnipeg to Fredericton, it's almost as if it's an invasion of these deer ticks that are surviving our winters. They used to winter, used to kill them in Canada. They're surviving and in physicians are worried sick about the, the outbreak of Lyme disease uh, because of this particular um, uh, 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 insect. And we're seeing that uh, ecologists are saying that there's so many ecological mismatches. You know, birds that are flying north to nest are used to arrive in the and when the birds would hatch, they, the young chicks would eat the, the mosquito larvae. Everything was fine, it was in order. Now the mosquito larvae are hatching before the birds are, are coming out and, and, and there's a mismatch and that's creating all kinds of problems. Um, we're seeing uh, of birds or pollinating insects and flowers opening up seem to be out of sync, you say. Uh, bumblebees, I mean, you're lucky if you see a bumblebee anymore. Uh, they are, in fact, uh, uh, being reduced uh, uh, because of, of the threats of the parasite and habitat change, and also hot temperatures. Bumblebees do not like hot temperatures. They can't tolerate it. And so what we're seeing is, is that is clearly a change. And we're also seeing, in terms of the uh, pollen production, 
plants are taller and bigger and more pollen is being injected. And the public health agency said in Canada that the ragweed season in Canada is close to a month longer than it was 20 years ago because of warmer temperatures. So why, why should we worry about this? Hey, Canada, aren't we the second coldest country in the world? Um, I go, aren't we the snowiest country in the world? I go to Winnipeg and I talk to Winnipeggers. I say, I've got some bad news for you. Your winters are going to be five degrees warmer. They say, could you make it 10 degrees? I mean, you know, we probably have a lot to give up. And there are going to be winners and, and losers in this. It's not as if we're, and you to be balanced, there are some good things, but bad things too. I think if we could vote on what we should get, we'd probably vote for the climate we got rather than the climate we're going to get. Because you see, it's not just about slushier winters and earlier springs. I think if it was, then, then we would be ahead of the game. The cost benefit analysis would be high. But you see, it's grade nine science. When you warm up the world, you get more energetic weather. I mean, it's known for 200 years. It's no, no debate about this fact. If you increase the global temperatures by one degree, the atmosphere can hold anywhere from seven to 12% more moisture. So if you, your place warms up by three degrees, well, those garden variety thunderstorms are gonna give you three times the amount of rain that you, uh, that you get. So, uh, you know, I, that's an important point is that, that extremes are going to be more likely. It's gonna be easier to create these. Uh, in the future. The other thing too, and this is something that I think you understand because you understand lake levels. Farmers clearly do. I've had farmers say to me, what's happening to the weather? It seems so variable. You know, it used to be that summers were hot and winters were cold. And now I've had farmers say to me, my gosh, I could have brought flood insurance and, and drought insurance in the same growing season. I mean, how do you deal with that? That's that wild weather. It's the jokers in the weather deck. It's weather 180. I mean, that kind of, you know, you expect in, a, in an agricultural business, your business plan says, okay, I'm going to have a bad year, two wet some years and two dry other years, but not back to back to back. I mean, what's, what's normal anymore? Normal is expect the unexpected. I mean, we base everything on normal weather. We build hospitals, schools, we take our vacation plans. You don't build California style homes in, in, um, in Bracebridge, you build them to suit the climate of that area. And so what is normal anymore, it just doesn't seem to be, uh, to be happening. And I think variability, the, probably the best way I could, I could illustrate it was through Great Lakes levels. You know, for most of my adult life in the, in the 60s, say late 60s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s, the Great Lakes levels were traditionally above average. In fact, there was a whole generation that grew up thinking, well, that's really what the levels are in the Great Lakes. They're high like this. There's not, people didn't say high or low. They just said, hey, they're high. I mean, they're higher than the average, but, but still they occur just year after year after year. And then there's a long period of low levels, you say. And at the beginning of, of um, 2013, the Great Lakes were not looking so great. The water levels of each of the lakes were well below the long-term average, which has been around since 1918 to now is the long-term, more than 100 years uh, length. And so what we saw, in fact, that Lake Michigan, Huron, Georgian Bay had dropped to its lowest levels in recorded history in 2013. And then just too many record dry seasons, uh, uh, year-round evaporation and, and half the ice cover of 30 years ago. And, and so we saw levels being depressed. But a remarkable thing happened um, that in 2013 in January, the levels of, of Georgian Bay, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, hydrologically interconnected, that the water levels were about 72 centimeters below the 100-year average. In a year and a half, or maybe 19, 20 months later, they were 17 centimeters above the long-term average in two years. Never have we ever seen that before. And it was just because we had uh, one of the wettest years on record. We had snow would just, you know, often snow in the Great Lakes is we, this, you rob Peter to pay Paul. 
the snow from the Great Lakes falls in the Great Lakes, and so there's no change. But a lot of the snow in that year came from outside of the basin and then into the basin. And the water uh, snow content, the water content of the snow was very moist. And, um, and so all of these contributed to, to higher, higher levels. So nowadays, lake levels at the beginning of May of this year, uh, in this 2022, uh, on the lakes in particular, and the uh, Michigan, Huron, Georgian Bay were about 27 centimeters, uh, 22 centimeters higher than they were this time last year, and about 27 centimeters higher than the long-term average. But what's sort of interesting, and this is not a fault of science, this is science in progress, that you know, 30, 20, 30 years ago, the forecast, the model suggested that what we'll be in store for in the future will be higher lake levels, just as we expect higher ocean temp, ocean levels, we say. But in fact, the better modeling, the better higher resolution, the better science has suggested that what we all see instead is more fluctuating levels, more a wide, uh, a more variability, higher and lower in a shorter period of time. And so that's really the message for those people who are dealing with the shorelines of the Great Lakes, whether it be marinas or uh, recreation people or cottagers or power production or, or shippers, commercial shippers, is you've got to plan for the infrastructure for more, more variation in, uh, in levels. So, hey, let me, uh, let me begin to uh, get closer to the wind up here. And, and let's talk about um, um, what the future is. Well, very simple. We think the future is going to be in central Ontario and the Georgian Bay area. Warmer, wetter, and wilder. Warmer. I mean, Georgian Bay will probably take um, only two decades ahead as to what it's warmed up in the last 50 or 60 years. Um, take the warmest period you ever remember, the warmest summer, maybe last summer, the summer before 1988, they were warm summers. By 2050, that'll be the coldest summer that we see. So there'll be fewer cold extremes. Um, you know, it's not going to be zero. We're still going to have to prepare for a warmer climate, but winter is still going to be um, noticeable in, in Canada. But there will be like no white Christmases. Um, skating on outdoor rinks will be probably limited. So those are the kind of social effects that we clearly will see with a change of climate. In terms of the of a wetter Ontario. Yes, we think um, there'll be too much water in some times, but too little water in most of the time. Acute and chronic water problems. Heavier doses of rain when it chooses to rain, but maybe not rain as often, per se. So 20-year floods may become the 10-year flood. And greater precipitation, we think, but it's less effective precipitation. It won't be enough to match the increase of temperature. So you're going to see problems with depleted aquifers and, and dried wetlands and, and yes, flooding, but, but, but also water shortages too. So what about wild weather? Well, the models are too coarse. We can't say whether, where and when and how much of these are going to occur. We just know that the kind of conditions that produce wild weather would be more prevalent. The more energy, the more instability in the atmosphere, those are the kinds of things that we are going to see more likely. So you're going to be more blowdown. There's going to be um, lightning um, uh, strikes. You know, when you warm it up, you cause for every degree of warming, maybe 15 to 20 percent more lightning strikes. So you know, I mean, that 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 could be an issue too. And and don't think that we're going to be Miami of the North. Well, what happens when your average temperature in the winter goes from minus eight to minus two? Well, instead of being assured of snow, you're going to have snow, rain, freezing rain, ice pellets, or a congealed mixture of all of the above. So our model suggests that one of the big issues going ahead will be the incidence of freezing rain and long bouts of it, you say. Because warming is, is so baked into the atmosphere, it's there, and you can't get rid of it. There's no scrubbing of the atmosphere to quiet that threat of a warmer world. We're almost guaranteed that storms going forward will be bigger, badder, and more impactful than what we see now. So more 
kind of uh, uh, future storms uh, will be super storms and that kind of thing. So we see impacts, of course, and here's a, a table that shows you, just to give you a sense of central Ontario, what were some of the kind of differences, say now or close to now, and say towards the end of this century. I think one of the big threats will be the greater number of hot days in the future compared to now, and particularly the greater number of, of tropical nights where you see uh, uh, two on average now with a temperature above 20 uh, uh, degrees where we see 25. And that's, that's really when we see heat waves, deadly heat waves of the, of the past, it's because the nighttime temperatures are warm. We'll clearly see more uh, uh, growing degree days. So we could certainly see uh, growing uh, 900 growing degrees more. So we'll be able to grow more uh, plants and food that will excite people. A more uh, a plant hardiness zone might increase by a, a zone or two, which will throw gardeners and, um, and the new exciting cultivars you could only dream of. But I think there'll be also uh, clearly some, um, some concerns. And one will be health for people. The, the stress that we have seen from heat waves, clearly both day and night, um, longer seasons. But also you end up with a warmer world. You end up with trees and plants that are growing in the wrong climate. And they started in a certain climate and now they're, they're in a different climate and there's more stress uh, to them. Uh, forest fires, of course, with lightning strikes, uh, more, uh, more pests uh, able to survive our, our winters. And of course, weeds are great adapters to, to climate change, more invasive species, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and we'll lose, I think, one of the tragedies for Ontario. We're not rich in biodiversity, but we'll lose that to some degree, and we'll have more open landscapes, which I think are, and that's why we have to protect uh, our, 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 our wildlands, our wilderness areas, so that we don't lose these uh, things. So, hey, what do we do about it? Well, I'll wind up with this, this thought. I think, you know, you just can't take a, a yoga breath and help and hope for the best. You know, hope is not a plan. And yet that is current policy. It's what we've always done. You know, we cross our fingers and hope nothing bad will happen. And if we're unlucky, well, okay, that 100-year storm which occurred last year, well, it will be 99 years before it happens again. That's what some of the thinking of mayors and councillors are when I talk to them. I mean, it doesn't mean that, but that's what the thinking is. So we'll continue to live in the floodplain, in the avalanche zone, and by the sea, and enjoy those, those environmental settings. And then we'll, in the springtime, when flood threatens, we'll bail and bag, and and we'll, um, and then we'll bury the dead and and chalk it up as as the cost of doing business. You know, our historical preference has been to spend billions of dollars in cleaning up, rather than spending millions of dollars in preventing the disaster in the first place. That's what it seems to be. So what we should do, okay. Well, I think what we need to do is to decarbonize. I'm not gonna preach about that. I, I, uh, to me, I'm not optimistic about that solution. We need to try and not just to bury it and trade it, but to conserve it. But we fly off to Kyoto and Copenhagen and Glasgow and Paris, and we sign documents, pat ourselves in the back and go back to normal living. I mean, it's, it's a failure because it requires changing human behavior, convincing people to invest for the common good of other people decades from now. I just don't think that's in line with the human condition. So I think reducing carbon emissions to what we need to do by 2050 is, is I think, unlikely. Uh, I think we're going to fall short of the target. So, I mean, we couldn't even do it during the pandemic. I mean, the, the cutting back was a little bit and then it just blossomed again. And the, the reservoir of CO2 in the atmosphere just climbed up during the, the pandemic years, you say. So, um, and even if we succeeded in cutting emissions dramatically, the coming years are still going to be rich in, in extreme storms because 
the greenhouse gases are already baked into the, into the system, you say. So I think what we need to do is we need to, and I'm not saying it because I come from the science department. I think we need to invest in science and technology and engineering. And to, again, here is hope being a plan, but that it's worked for us in the past. And so perhaps maybe we'll, we'll get some breakthroughs, especially from the energy side that will, will save us, will we'll cushion the blow when we go ahead. That's, we, need, we need to have that uh, as a possibility. But I think a sensible approach would be to prepare for it. A better plan is to anticipate the disaster and reduce the risk before it happens. I mean, you're not going to stop the rains, but as I say, you can prevent it from becoming a disaster by properly planning for it and, and responding to it. We need to embrace adaptation and build resiliency in our communities, in, in, our, in our lands, in our areas, by making our communities and neighborhoods more weatherproof, more livable, more likable, and, and more desirable because of that. Now, it's hard to promote that, ladies and gentlemen, because people think you're throwing in the towel. You're giving up when you say, well, I'm going to adapt rather than de decarbonize. I think you got to do it on all fronts. I mean, this is the greatest challenge, environmental challenge that humankind has ever faced. And we can't just let, you know, put all the eggs in one basket. We have to do everything that we possibly can. But our existing infrastructure is designed for a climate that is no longer our climate. No wonder we're seeing the kind of impacts and effects that this runaway kind of warming is causing. I mean, I think that a great American philosopher, Yogi Berra, said it right when he said, the future ain't what it used to be. And the future is not going to look like the past. You know, we used to spend all of our efforts on the past was a guide to the future. Well, that worked for many, many years and decades. It doesn't work. The climate has changed so dramatically that, that that sort of almost mitigates the effect that that change, exist, real change has, you say. So I think what we need to do is that we need to update our and strengthen our building codes. We need to have building standards based on what will happen, not what has happened. I think that's obvious. We need to enforce building codes. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I have seen after tornadoes, after earthquakes, after, sorry, um, uh, hurricanes, after wild windstorms, I have seen infrastructure that was not designed to code. And somebody was asleep at the switch. We shouldn't let that happen. And for Pete's sake, in a budget crunch, often the first thing that goes is maintenance. <laughs> That seems that to me is the definition of foolish and short-sighted. I mean, that's sometimes a save in our bacon by just maintaining what we have. Because you know, some of that infrastructure was built in a different climate and is now operating under a different climate. And maybe it's not worthy. And maybe we need to inspect it and shore it up to safeguard us from, from future, uh, future uh, disasters. And I think the other thing I would say and, and end with this is that I think leaving natural areas natural is really what we should be doing. I, I really think let nature protect you from itself, you say. And we've seen so many examples with Katrina and with Sandy and some of the other major events, but those areas that we had green space really did not suffer as some of those urban spaces that that were transformed. I know everybody talks about climate change, ladies and gentlemen, but very few are willing to do anything about it. But thankfully, someone is doing something about it. And I think it is what the Georgian Bay Land Trust is doing with their environmental actions, their visionary investment in our natural world. What you are doing is protecting the wilderness of the Georgian Bay area for for all Canadians from the ravages of, of climate change by securing and restoring nature's green infrastructure, by preserving our habitats and wetlands, by beautifying our landscapes and by initiating sustainability. I think all Canadians should feel good about what you do and how well you do it for the benefit of all. And I applaud you 
Uh, I'm inspired by the video. I keep coming back to that, how, how that was transformable in, in so many ways. So, hey, in conclusion, let me say, I think the evidence of runaway climate change is, is all around us. It's in all regions and all seasons and all sectors and, and everybody has a stake in it. It's not hypothetical. It's not a, a future th threat. It's uh, not on the horizon. It's here and now and here to stay. It's not about, um, it's really about now present danger. It's not, you know, fake news. It's not a conspiracy. It's not just about, hey, skinny polar bears. Um, climate change, I think, is the defining challenge of our times. Thank you very much.